or serves as an educational medium and an outreach program through which one can learn from and engage with renowned researchers, educationalists, policy makers, innovators to come and share valuable insights and learnings of their own. Today, we have Dr. Shrivari Chandra Shekhar, sir, former secretary to the government, Ministry of Science and Technology, who is going to deliver a lecture on science, Stone Age to Gen, Gen Alpha. I request all of you to maintain decorum throughout this lecture and keep your cell phones on silent mode. Questions will be attended at the end of the lecture. Before we proceed, I kindly request you all to stand up for the Sumaya prayer. to request Dr. Suresh Ukarande, sir, Principal of KJ Somaya Institute of Technology to present the welcome address. Good morning to all of you. 
on behalf of management i welcome you all to this somaya public lecture which will be delivered by eminent person dr srivari chandrashekar who is a uh, secretary of the government of india department of science and technology sri samir somaya chairman of uh, somaya vidya vihar and vice uh, chancellor of somaya vidya vihar university vice chancellor dr rashekran pillai secretary somaya vidya vihar lieutenant general jagbir singh dr shubha pandit principal of the institute and uh, hois hods faculty and staff and students of somaya vidya vihar and somaya vidya vihar university let me take a couple of minutes to introduce about the somaya vidya vihar and somaya vidya vihar university somaya vidya vihar have started its first school in maharashtra in 1942 82 years before and then uh, this campus at vidya vihar in 1959 and now today in this 2023 you see this uh, the campus which is grown at vidya vihar campus at sayan campus and other campuses in maharashtra karnataka gujarat and madhya pradesh there are mainly two campuses in mumbai that is this one vidya vihar and other one is at ayur vihar sayan campus third campus in maharashtra is at nareshwadi dahanu taluka and in ahmednagar district there are schools and in karnataka at bagalkot there are schools in uh, gujarat kutch also there are schools and various courses are being run in all these campuses we have at this uh, under the umbrella of somaya vidya vihar 34 plus institutions wherein approximately 40000 students are taking education right from school to phd and uh, which is mentored by guided by the 3000 plus faculties and establishment of this universities is uh, happened in 2019 august 2019 four years before but it was i mean just i mean uh, uh, whatever the institutes were in this campus and uh, somaya vidya vihar was trying for the to become a university since almost 10 years but it has happened in 2019 and very from very first year itself uh, it has uh, the courses what the university has aligned as per the national education policy 2020 you know it uh, what national education policy 2020 says is you have to have i mean so many institute at one campus engineering management arts science commerce and many more which will give the liberal arts and so many things and it was there in this campus so it was only mere a formation of a university which is formed in 2019 and all the colleges all the programs all the courses uh, all the curriculum is aligned as per the national education policy and government of maharashtra has implemented national education policy in 2022 uh, and this campus already has many more things aligned as per the national education policy and uh, in due course of time uh, uh, this this the whatever the courses are there the uh, research based courses activity based courses or uh, innovation based courses will be are the part of the curriculum and and it will uh, the somaya vidya vihar university to be one of the prominent university best university in the not only in the maharashtra but in the country the ana this initiative what for uh, the initiative which is the branch child of honorable uh, vice chancellor uh, vice chancellor dr rashekan pillai is the somaya public lecture we invite so many eminent persons from academia research uh, literature music and so many uh, since 2 3 years we have invited so many eminent persons and today's lecture is uh, part of uh, one of the activity of the somaya public lecture i welcome dr shrivari chandrashekar for this uh, somaya public lecture thank you very much thank you so much sir i would now like to call upon shri somi somaya sir to come upon and say a few words
डॉक्टर चंद्रशेखर सर वेलकम टू आवर कैंपस डॉक्टर पिल्लई जनरल जगबीर सिंह एंड एवरीबडी एल्स माई स्टूडेंट फ्रेंड्स सर साइंस आर मोटो ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूशन इज ज्ञाना देव टू कैवल्यम नॉलेज फ्रॉम नॉलेज अलोन लिबरेशन एंड लिबरेशन कम्स इन वेरियस फॉर्म्स इट कुड बी फ्रॉम पॉवर्टी एंड इट कुड बी नॉलेज दैट टेक्स एस टू द मून एंड साइंस इज द बेड रॉक और अ थिंकिंग माइंड अ क्यूरियस माइंड एंड हियर इन आर इंस्टीट्यूशन वी ऑलवेज वॉन्टेड टू क्रिएट एन इन्वायरमेंट ऑफ क्यूरियासिटी एंड टू एनेबल पॉसिबिलिटीज आई एज एज द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी यू हैव encourage science across the country in education institutions and in research institutions we want to become a research university one that excels in research education and service at the same time we want to be proudly indian and we want to be universal in the reach of our ideas and we believe that currently with the g20 with the delhi declaration the desire to make a more inclusive world a more sensitive world i think we are in a place where indian education institutions can also show that we can be among the best in the world if you go to 1992 i joined my father's business family business in 1st january 93 it was in 91 or 92 when uh, the government at that time had liberalized at that time there was no indian shall i say business to talk about in the world today when we look back there are so many the new education policy has only recently freed us uh, and allowed us to think and we are only 4 years old as a university as we keep growing and integrating we believe in the next 20 years 25 years indian higher education will also become one of the best in the world science teaching and service so thank you very much for coming Now I would like to request our Vice Chancellor, Mr. V. N. Raja Shekharan Pillai, sir, to come forward and deliver his presidential remarks and introduce the speaker. Uh, Dr. Shivari Chandra Shekhar, sir, I will request you to come on stage, and Samir, sir, as well. a huge round of applause i would now request dr shrivari chandra shekhar to proceed with the session good morning everybody distinguished scientists professor dr shrivari chandra shekhar our chancellor mr samir somaiya my colleagues from the university and all allied institutions distinguished invitees dear students ladies and gentlemen first of all let me on my personal behalf and on behalf of the somaiya vidya vihar institutions and dear somaiya vidya vihar institutions welcome dr shivari chandra shekhar to the somaiya public lecture i take this opportunity to thank him profusely for accepting our invitation in spite of his extremely busy schedule till yesterday 
he was the secretary of department of science and technology today a new secretary has joined he was also uh, <coughs> chairman of the uh, department of science and technology uh, he is a very distinguished organic chemist i know him for the last 40 years through his organic chemistry colleagues and all that he has contributed significantly he has covered all he has received all the big prizes in the country in science including the infosys uh, uh, science award for physical sciences he is a fellow of the all the academies of science in the country he has been recognized nationally and internationally for his work in chiral organic synthesis uh, which has very relevance in pharmaceutical chemistry uh, the somaya public lectures is definitely some sort of a an outreach activity which we do uh, to reach, to bring such people and introduce them to our faculty and also the students uh, to give a bro uh, the holistic view of what is happening in different areas of knowledge and uh, i am very sure that this university it is getting transformed into a as the, our chancellor mentioned it is getting transformed into a teaching and research and then to the to your research university the type of emphasis which are which we are giving for research is enormous Uh, we are giving uh, scholarships junior scholarships and senior scholarships and research fellowships which are a little bit more than the national scholarship yesterday of course the government of india has increased the national scholarships so we are trying to promote research, uh, research endeavors in all our activities we uh, unconventionally interact with the industry to support the research and teaching and we know we have a good number of activities which help which uh, which are designed to increase the diversity including the uh, gender diversity in this university we have recently got a, a scheme from basf to support it and dr achala danith director of uh, dean of research is uh, spearheading that particular activity we are also reaching to the public in an in an unconventional way uh, we are being supported by our own companies uh, our own companies Uh, the godavari bio refineries limited and also the other r&d institutions which we support as uh, so the students have the opportunity to enter into projects with not only in this country across the world uh, we are, we are interacting with uh, universities across the across the country and across the world to provide to give our students opportunity to go abroad and do the capstone projects uh, these are all initiatives which we are taking up uh for the last several years and particularly focusedly after the uni after the uh, freedom which we got as a university we are one among the uh, our our uh, several of our programs including the management engineering uh, thermal studies these are all in, uh, education these are all highly rated programs in the in the country and our emphasis as i mentioned in the earlier it is for strengthening research also because so far we have been under we have been part of the mumbai university system for our conventional uh, engineer higher edu higher and technical education uh, our medical college is part of the maharashtra university of health sciences so of course all these uh, syllabus curriculum all these things were defined by these universities now we have the freedom we have the freedom of course um, uh, our motto itself is freedom of possibilities today i was really happy when uh, abhiyandri was uh, inaugurated we could see the freedom the students were taking to, for innovating this thing today morning uh, dr chandrashekar inaugurated abhiyandri which is a national flagship program uh, which is being conducted by the kj somaya college of engineering let me thank dr chandrashekar for inaugurating that particular program and let me also congratulate the students who have taken the lead uh, for uh, arranging such activities Uh, dr chandrashekar i am going uh, I, there is no need of introduction to him uh, because we have already circulated the thing uh, of course i don't want to read the entire uh, cv of dr chandrashekar he very distinguished organic chemist uh, he took voluntary retirement from the government of india uh, and working in in the csir continued to work in the csir as he has been doing for the last several decades uh, starting from uh, andhra university 
Us Usmania, starting from Usmania University, coming to the uh, CSIR laboratory. I know him very well. Uh, some of my students are also uh, some sort of a co-workers uh, with him who, have, uh, who are excelling in this field. And let me wish him the very best in his further endeavors in organic chemi in chemistry and in science. And the topic which we have selected today is uh, science, a uh, perspective on science from Stone Age to Gen Alpha. I am sure that uh, you, we all will be benefited by this intervention. And let me once again wish Dr. Chandrasekhar the very best for his public lecture and also for his furtherance of the research, uh, promo research activities as well as the leadership activities which he has been doing in this country, not only for the academia but for the industry. His relevant, his, the, the relevance of his researches in the industry, you can just look at the website and find out how many pharmaceutical industries are making use of his patents. He has over 7,000 cite, uh, 7, citations and several patents and several of his patents are being used by pharmaceutical companies across the country and uh, across the world. And we are really fortunate to have you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, with us. And we will, we will, we will definitely uh, hear your public lecture and we will continue to interact with you for strengthening this institution as a research institution as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I would now request Samir sir, and Pillai, sir, to enjoy the uh, session and Dr. Shivari Chandrasekhar, sir, to proceed with it. Good morning to all of you and as uh, our students uh, make the mic arrangements and my remote uh, pointer, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pillai for inviting me here and the management for the hospitality. What I will try to do in the next one hour, actually I am uh, mycophilic, so someone who has love for the mic. Okay, so phobia is mycophobic and uh, philic is affiliation. You know, my hydrophilic is love towards the water. So I'm mycophilic and I generally tend to detach myself from here till people start walking away from back benches or some whistles happen from behind. So whenever you decide, I think I need a signal from the audience, then I know that my time is done. But otherwise, my slides will keep on going and I, I'll keep on talking. So, what I'll do is, uh, while, what is this mic going? Okay, take care. I'll stand and talk. Okay, yeah. Because the freedom of, you said the freedom, no, I have no freedom now. Okay, then that's okay, I think we'll manage, I think. So, he wanted me to freeze here and look at him. And uh, like inaugurations you do and then it doesn't work, but he'll change the slide. So, <laughs> that's okay. So, what I'll try to do in the next one hour approximately, but as I told you, uh, I keep on talking, my request is to alert me sometime, maybe one of you, okay? So, I choose a topic today, uh, the science, stone age to Zen Alpha. And this title talk I am giving for a second time. So, this is reasonably freshly baked uh, content. It's okay. <coughs> so, it's a freshly baked content and... Uh, I gave this talk a few months ago uh, when Professor Siena Rao called me to ISC Bangalore because Siena Rao, whatever award monies he gets generally, he pulls into a foundation and uh, he creates lecture series like what Professor Somaya is doing here. 
So I was called to give CNRO Endowment Lecture in ISC Bangalore. And I was told the audience are from engineering department, science departments, and also like a public lecture for non-scientists. So I thought I should talk less science and more nonsense. So I choose to, this title today. So what I'll try to tell you today before we proceed, uh, we all lost a great soul, uh, Dr. Saminathan. And uh, there was an editorial some time ago, aptly written, every seed grown in this country, his name is written. I think that's the contribution he has made uh, through Green Revolution. Otherwise, maybe half of us would have been uh, starving or maybe getting uh, wheat from US and sugar from Brazil and all that. I think this is a great soul we lost. Uh, but I think every day you eat our meal, I think time to remember this great soul. So what I'll try to do is uh, I'll tell you Science is not begun yesterday, not day before yesterday. Science is there since humanity is born. The day the human evolution has happened from a unicellular organism to whatever we are, Homo sapiens sapien. Again, I call the Homo sapien as the most selfish living creature on this planet. I'm sure we have to endorse this statement because this is the only creature on this planet who is worried about tomorrow's food, who is worried about day after tomorrow's movie, who is worried about battery charging for 48 hours, 72 hours. So I think we are creatures we wanted for tomorrow, day after tomorrow. And as Mahatma Gandhi has stated in his biography, there's enough on this planet for the needy people, but there's not enough for the greedy people. So we need to learn from animals. If you look at the apex predator, supposed to be tiger, or a lion if you want to call, in a forest, and even this apex predator does not hunt when it is not hungry. My own experiences in Tadaba forest in, in Maharashtra, and Pinch and Kanha, where my son and my wife run, started uh, trying to run some resorts. We have walked next to a tiger 10 feet away by accident, but the tiger doesn't even bother that you are there because it already had a meal and not hungry to eat. And if you go to Gir Forest and see the lions, the lion pride of 15 lions, if they got their meal already, they're sleeping, and even if you're on a bicycle, they don't even look at you. But we as human beings, when the announcement in Big Bazaar that there is a sale going on and then we all get excited. And I lived in the US for some time. And when there's a sale of Coke, I used to live in Dallas and Houston is about 150 miles away. If Houston there's a Coke sale, we all go to Houston to buy Coke and then dump our refrigerators, knowing that they'll expire someday. And we expire if we drink so much coke anyway. So we are the most selfish living beings on this planet. And my talk today is, would take you through the science interventions, the initial interventions of science. If you want to talk on the revolutions, OK? Revolutions are not a bad word because revolutions happen for good many times. So industrial revolution, one, two, three, four. So when a revolution happens, a change happens. So if you look at the damages we have done to this planet in the last two centuries, especially since the industrial revolution, is five times larger than the damages the entire humanity has done since Homo sapien was born on this planet. Imagine the kind of damage we have done. I only tell you an anecdote. When Ford and Mercedes, Benz, Benz company and Ford launched their first car, a four-wheeler, the announcement from the chairman of the Ford company, I think it was in 1890 or 1900, that we are going to launch a four-wheeler transportation 
which will give a little smoke from behind. But it would be the most cleanest transportation we are introducing onto this planet. Exactly after 100 years of this revolution, we are cursing petrol, we are cursing diesel, we are cursing that little smoke. Before that, the transportation was either a bullock cart or on a horse. And the complaint given by the Ford is when you are using the animals, they are le left behind the dung, which is spoiling the roads. And cleaning of the dung has become a pain. So my car is not going to leave anything on the road. But after 100 years, we realized that whatever smoke these engines we have created during the revolution have created the global warming. And yesterday's newspaper says that in South America, the dolphins are dying because of the temperatures in the Amazon River. So, global warming, we blame that carbon dioxide is the biggest culprit. I'm going to tell the entire story because the chairman wants to use. I thought I'll complete the story. And then the slides will go on. So, when we look at the damages we have done, as human beings or the living things, this Mother Earth has given everything in a proper oxidation state. Who has studied high school chemistry? who wrote the uh, engineering entrance or a medical entrance, you have studied oxidation reductions and electrochemistry a little bit. So nature has given everything in the perfect oxidation state. Nature has given you fossil fuel as unoxidized charcoal, which is a carbon. Petrol, which is a linear hydrocarbon, or a diesel, which is just hydrocarbons. But we put into the engine, and it will oxidize into carbon dioxide. We all take oxygen from the planet and give out carbon dioxide. And then we say that now the parts per million carbon dioxide which is there about 390, 400 ppm, when it crosses 450, we know that that 1.5 degrees commitment, I think today our chairman was mentioning about the G20 and the commitments of all of us towards the Mother Earth. If that 1.5 degree number which is on our heads like a knife which will fall on us whenever that 1.5 degrees temperature increase on this planet. We know that all the Arctic, Antarctic, Himalaya and everything will melt and then the sea levels will increase and maybe Bombay will not be there. I'm a great soul, I'm from Telangana, we have no sea. We had little sea but we fought with Andhra people and gave the sea to them. <laughs> so we are landlocked state and we are well protected. Okay, so we as human beings or oxidizing agents of this planet. We take everything which is the neutral state. We all know that nitrogen is a great element. Nitrogen is there about 60% or 50% in this air, whatever we are taking. I think we have only 60% nitrogen, only 30% oxygen, remaining all other gases. We take nitrogen and oxidize and make it nitric oxide. And we blame that nitric oxide is a greenhouse gas which is going to create global warming. We take carbon from the nature, we make it carbon dioxide. Sulfur is a nice element. We oxidize sulfur to sulfur dioxide and claim sulfur dioxide is a bad gas. So we are the oxidants of this planet. All the living beings, mostly human beings, are the oxidants. And I think at the cost of our comfort, the so-called comfort, we have spoiled the planet. I can only tell you that the backbenchers from third row onwards, who are students most probably, and some faculty must have sat there to impress me that they are also young. I accept you. <laughs> so the problem is, are we handing over this planet to these backbenchers the way I have got from my grandfather? If today our chancellor has got this planet in a way he got from his grandfather, are we going to give back this planet in the same shape to the, our next generation? So that is where science will play an important role. And I do believe that the next 40 minutes, hopefully, when I take you the journey of science, which originated from Stone Age till Zen Alpha, which are our backbenchers today, whether we are taking the science in the right direction or do we need course correction. 
one special statement I want to make is we have been talking of net zero, sustainability of the planet, global warming. These are the three buzzwords you call anyone for a public lecture. These are the only three keywords they use. So now, why we have to use these keywords and bombard all of you? Because at least this generation has realized that something has gone wrong during the industrial revolutions and we need to do the course corrections. And if we don't do course corrections, the fate of all these backbenchers, the so-called backbenchers, the Zen Alpha kids in 2050 would have to remember the movie of Rajnikanth. I think in Telugu it was called uh, Chitti. The Chitti was the character where we create a human robot and uh, this robot doesn't listen to Rajnikanth and it creates havoc and then only Rajnikanth can stop it. Because Rajnikanth is the one who can make sun rise on the western side. Okay, so next slide please. Yeah, so my title, my science, are you on Eric's slide? Already, yeah, next up, please, yeah, okay. So if you look at most of my talk today, is a copy paste, I think my friend sitting here, if I'm coming your way, maybe, you can be a leftist from a rightist. <clears throat> so if you look at uh, this, John Gribbin's book, Science, a History, Almost 50% of this talk, what I'm going to speak, has been taken as a copy-paste or with some masala spices added into this book. So if you look at the statement, science is a personal activity. With very few exceptions, scientists throughout the history have applied their craft not through a lust for glory or material reward, but in order to satisfy their own curiosity about the way the world works. I think this is the science statement, but is it hold, holding good for today's scientists? I think has to be question asked. When science was done 300 years ago or 500 years ago, there was no DST, there was no Sumaya Fellowship. So if someone wants to research, either this scientist, he or she, either would sell their own personal properties and do an experiment or go to the king and tell an idea and take little wealth from the king and try to do some research which will be for the welfare or the comfort. I don't want to use the welfare but the comfort of homo sapiens. But today we wanted a materialistic reward, we wanted a cash prize or we wanted recognition or our name should appear in the newspapers. I think we have become conscious and we have become more like film stars that scientists would like to have celebrity status. But scientist is the one who works at the back end without expecting any rewards, but I believe that my science has to do good for tomorrow. So that's the message this whole book gives you. Next slide, please. So just to educate for friends who are not aware of the generations, of course, you can always go to Google and, and find an answer. So I have given you the various generations. I've not taken too long, as I told. We have just taken the industrial revolution onwards. So those people who are born in 1883 to 1900, they are called the lost generation. I don't know why they're called lost generation, but if you look at the definition, World War I generation. So poor fellows were part of fightings and war across the nations and those generations are called the lost generation. Of course, then we have the greatest generation which is World War II and later so they realized the problems of World War and that's where UN was made, people were trying to make countries which don't fight amongst each other, so that became little greater generation. Then we had a silent generation, then we had baby boomers, that's the time when there's rise in population and world started getting full of opportunities. And most of the front bingers, I think, belong to the baby boomer generation or born after 60, for example. And then, of course, we had Gen X, who are MTV generation, punk music kind of people. Then, of course, millennials, Zen Y, first global generation. 
then we had Gen Z, then tech savvy generations, of course, Zen Alpha, which are all were born uh, more recently. So if you look at the way <coughs> we have classified our generations, generally a generation is about 20 to 30 years because the gap, age gap between you and your parents is about 25, 30 years, depending on which part of the world you belong to. And that 30 years is one generation gap. Today, you may not accept the views of your parents because you are a next generation. Similarly, your parents may not accept your thing because they belong to one generation before you. But this classification of all of us show that the first four generations, what I spoke about, people who are up to Gen X, I think we are the ones who are part of making materials at an affordable price. I think, again, this is something which all were very concerned. Everything I want to make is affordable so that everyone can get it, starting from medicines to electronics to food to transportation. Everything we wanted affordable. But at what cost? At the cost of the environment. I think that's the biggest mistake we have done as some of our generations. Because of this affordability as the driving parameter for all the industries, not worried about whether I'm generating carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide or nitric oxide, or am I taking the earth crust and taking away all the elements from the periodic table. I think that is where the problem has begun. And today, if maybe in the last 10 years, that key word I used, sustainability, net zero, these are the kind of preachings now we are doing so that hopefully we stop the nuisance what we have done and then we do better science for better day after tomorrow. Next slide, please. So as I told, science is not new to any of us. Science was there, even the Stone Age. Because if you look at, again, the history of the evolution, starting from whatever amoeba or unicellular organism to mammals, the evolutionary process, if you look at even at Homo erectus or a Homo sapien, the human beings who were smart enough who started using the sharp stone objects. For example, he realized that instead of using a stone which is round in shape, if it is sharp at one edge, he had the power to kill a lion or a tiger. Similarly, the moment they realized from a distance I can throw a sharp object on an animal, that's the time human conquered over the animal kingdom and became the apex Predator. I don't want to call it predator because we don't eat, but we, we became the apex predators of this planet. That's how we started learning how to use an arrow. Then we went on to discover a small gun. From there, of course, we have some military officers here. Now, on a mobile phone, you can write a program and some rocket will launch from somewhere and it can go and hit any other country. So this evolutionary process of science, the origins are how I can use a weapon from a distance kill or make my enemy suffer. I think that's where the journey of science has begun. And just to make, when this Homo sapiens was killing animals, and when the winter sets on, they realized, because they are bare, they are no cotton those days, so to protect themselves, they started whatever leather is left over after killing an animal and eating the meat and all that. So they started wearing it that skin of the animals as a warming material for them to protect themselves from winter. Now, we intentionally kill the animals, including snakes, or a calf, or a cow, or buffalo, or whatever, to make nice leather jackets with Armani brand, or I don't know, whatever the best brands today we have, or a high design brand, and then you end up paying $1,000 per leather coat. So, the innovation of wearing a leather material for protecting your skin from winters is not discovered by yesterday or day before yesterday. It was discovered by a stone age person. I'm not using the gender here. Stone age person. So this is how people started observing what is happening around us. And science has evolved over a period of millions of years. Next slide, please. So if you look at this slide, I just wanted to tell you when the Paleolithic time to Neolithic 
to 2020. I have put a calendar, but I wanted to add this slide 2050. Maybe next talk, if you call me. Look at it, the average age expectancy of our ancestors, our great ancestors, during Paleolithic time was about 30 years. Then it dropped during Bronze and 18th century, one because of wars and one because of evolution of bacteria and infections. So we had a dip in the life expectancy. And as we discovered antibiotics, thanks to Fleming, and of course many healthcare mechanisms we got, vaccines and all that, it started going up. And average years has gone up to now, I think 70 in India, 68, 70 in India. And of course, if you go to France, Japan, European world, especially the Nordic countries, people may live 95, 100, 101. And home for aged, if you look at, you see some people at the age of 102, 102 is not so uncommon if you look at uh, the countries which are wealthy countries. So science has made us live longer. Also, the culture of all of us that no country should occupy other country as per UN Charter. Slowly, the deaths in the wars have come down. We have reduced the burden a little bit on our army friends. Of course, sometimes we fight among ourselves and then we need to call them. Like in Manipur today morning, our officer was making a statement. But end of the day, the deaths in war have come down. That's how the average age has gone up. Diseases are not there. Food quality is better, thanks to Swaminathan. So all is well for the last 100 years. And then we have shot up to 72. And we all see Amitabh Bachchan's advertisement. He says that thousand full moons one will see and then he advertises some insurance company or I don't know whatever he advertises, I don't remember. So that's the way the life has gone up. And I want you to read oldest confirmed recorded age is 122 years. And even Hindu believes it's 120 years. I was just reading one of a book from a Christian friend. Even in biblical documents, it says that human life is not 100 years. It is 120. I know somewhere in between, people have curtailed it to 100. And then our pujari also, you pay some money to pray and bet some uh, ticket for blessings. He will bless you, Shatamanam Bhavati. Or you tell him, my Shata Khatam Bhavati, Ekso Bhis Karavi. Because that's what is described in our ancestral scripts. And which is going to happen by 2050. I was reading another book on science. Hopefully I'll share sometime the title of the book in, during my talk. It says the way we are doing the stem cell therapy and the kind of medical interventions we are doing, the robotic interventions, the organ transplantations happening, the kind of anti-aging research we are doing today globally. 120 is reachable by 2050. That means, again, I'm taking my friends in the back benches, third row onwards. You're all in the age group of 17, 18, 20, 21. So when you are 50, by the time these technologies will be on top of the world, that you can go to a vending machine, you feel that your heart is paining, you don't require to go to a cardiologist to do some repairs on the heart. At a vending machine, you order your stem cells, which you preserved at minus 80 degrees. Now stem cell banks have come, umbilical cards are being preserved. Now you grow your own heart, or grow your own lung, and then reinstate, and then you behave like a 30 year old young boy or a girl. Again, live for another 40 years, and whenever something goes wrong, again you repair that part. This is not a dream, which is going to happen the way the investments into stem cell research, anti aging is happening in the world in multinational companies, which is going to be reality. Okay? So be prepared to live 120, 130. Next slide, please. So if you look at uh, the journey of all of us as homo sapiens. We also measure ourselves, you know, I'm first in class, second in class, third in class. We have seen movie Three Idiots. Generally, if our friend gets first in class, we are not very happy. We want, like I fail, he also should fail. I think that's our, but if you look at the rankings in, I'm sure our university friends also will strive to get NRF ranking, under 20, under 10, over 50. I mean, we are all driven by those numbers. Human beings' brains are always statistical mind. I want a number. So if you look at the happiness index of all our countries, we are nowhere in top 15, 20, most unhappy souls. 
I don't want to give her number, or if I've written the slide, I want to hide it. No, it's not written. I'm glad. I think we are somewhere around 110, or I don't know. Okay. So if you look at these countries, countries which have good quality life, as I told, Nordic countries, if you look at Denmark, Switzerland, or European countries. So these are the countries who are happy souls. That means their pension scheme is very good. So <laughs> their pension schemes are good. You can retire at whatever age you want. The pension money, what you get post-retirement is more than what you are getting in service. That's why those who know a little bit of French history, France. I was traveling a couple of three years ago, just before the COVID, and everyone on strike. I said, what is happening? They're fighting to reduce the retirement age. Very unusual country. We all fight with the government to increase our retirement age. So why France railway trains and all guys are on strike? I asked my collaborator, Rene Griere, what is happening, Professor Rene? He said, no, no, Chandra, actually, you know, I'm getting more money after retirement than I was getting in service. I want to retire faster. So those countries are the happy countries, okay? Then parameter for happiness, GDP, healthy years of life. That's what I said, health. Social support, trust, freedom to make life decisions. We have freedom to operate in this campus. That's what we have been talking. So you are happy souls. Of course, generosity has to be there. Generosity is not giving some 10 rupees to a beggar at a signal. That is a, that's not generosity, actually. You are encouraging something which is not good for the country. Generosity is something. Today morning, I was telling one of our young colleagues in the, in the car coming out. Can you adapt a girl child from Islam area or a boy from Islam area Every day evening, 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock, I go to that slum. See that this girl does the homework. And tomorrow, that girl is proud to go to school. Because today, many children don't go to school because they don't do homework. And they are scared of teacher. The teacher will beat them in a government school. So that is generosity. You take your own time and give to the society and see that whole country has best education possible. People are aware of what is happening around them. I think that is generosity. Of course, environment, social, urban, and natural phenomena. So I do believe that India by 2050, as our Honorable Prime Minister keeps telling us, will be a developed nation and hopefully will be among top 20, if not bottom 20. Hopefully that's aspiration, all we should have. But to look at the happiness, one needs to be healthy. I work in health sciences a little bit of generic drugs, a little bit of drug discovery. Agriculture, of course, is very critical, but these two sectors or driven by energy. The biggest concern, what we have created over the last 100 years of revolution, we have exhausted the entire fossil fuels, whatever coal we get, uh, which is created after millions of years of uh, what you call the animals the, which die under a sea, or the forest, deforest, the forest uh, live, and all this takes about million years before coal is formed. Similarly, your petrol, diesel, or all these fossil fuels, is a million year effort by the Mother Earth to give us, and in 120 years of industrial revolution, we have exhausted all these things. So we are worried now where the energy will come to support agriculture, and how, if we don't have proper nutrition, how are we going to protect our health? So for happiness, of course, these three are required, and the biggest worry for all of us has to be, how am I going to create energy cheaper, and which is also renewable. So again, the science will drive it. And again, my friends, mechanical engineers or whoever are trying to make uh, the energy from renewable resources. Either you are rotating a wheel to get the energy or you are going to split the water to get hydrogen. I think those are the science problems we need to address today. Otherwise, in 2050, you will go back to what I told the fourth statement. All of you go back to bullock carts telling that we have abandoned all these bad smoke-giving vehicles and back to a horse riding or a bullock cart ride. So 2050 is something we need to watch, that we need to create alternate source of energy so that agriculture survives, health survives, and of course, this planet survives. Next slide, please. So as I told, science is something which we need to do with passion. A scientist is a person who works in and has expert knowledge of a particular field of science. And I've given some rules for a scientist, again taken from, from the book what I refer to you. See failure as a beginning. Scientists have to learn that failure is a beginning, not the end. Never stop learning. A scientist cannot say that, okay, 
I am now learn all my syllabus in the classroom and I don't require to read anything. I think you need to update your knowledge by reading journals and whatever comes. Not the WhatsApp university, but the right universities where science come out. Assume nothing, question everything. Teach others what you know. And one problem with most of us, at least scientists, is if I share what I know to my friend, oh, he may compete with me and he will get Infosys award, so better I will not tell him anything. I think we need to teach what we know so that we can do a collective cooperative science. Analyze objectively. Practice humility. Never be proud that I'm great. Respect constructive criticism. Someone says your work is not good or because of your chemistry, environment is getting warmer. I think you accept it if it is right. Don't argue. Give credit where it is due. Again, maybe some of the young students, they are not doing research yet. But one problem we encounter in science is not giving credit to others. So giving references is very critical if you're taking references some work. Ask the tough questions early. Love what you do or leave. I mean, of course, this may be an ideal situation. But whatever you get, you please love it. Sometimes you may not get what you want. I want Nobel Prize. I didn't get oh, That's OK. Or I want to become chancellor of this university. I did not become. But still, I got. Secretary Government of India or I got DST, I mean, Director IAC or a scientist. I love what I have got already. So that's what we need to adapt ourselves so that you become not only a good scientist but a good human being. Next slide, please. When did I start? By the way, I didn't see the time. But please stop me, so I told you. So again, science, like this world map I have put here, what happened over a period of time as I told, when Big Bang happened, those who want to believe Big Bang happened, and that's how this whole universe is formed or this planet is made, I don't think that generation required a passport or a visa to travel from one part of the Earth to other part of the Earth. I don't want to call con continents because even continents were not found. But then as we progressed, the evolution happened. I think that's the theme of your exhibition today that evolution so as the evolution processed we made boundaries of each countries starting from East Germany West Germany which you cannot bifurcate India Pakistan for example or US Canada even if they are land connected we have broken our countries and we made partitions which is okay for a sovereign nation all that was okay after UN Charter but if you look at science we also made that mistake what Human beings have made for the planet. We have done even within science. That is now troubling all of us in doing interdisciplinary science. Today, scientist thinks he is great. Engineer thinks he is great. Physics fellow thinks he is great. Or chemist thinks, I am central science. Actually, I always tell chemistry the central science. If that slide comes, I'll quickly throw it out. Chemists believe that this whole universe is chemistry because what you sit in the chair is plastic is chemistry or the cotton is chemistry, it's all carbohydrate, or what you eat is chemistry, your DNA is chemistry, your protein is chemistry, amino acids. So chemist feels that everything is chemistry. Even if you go to Mars, there are some elements. If you go to Moon, there are elements. Today we are struggling to see what elements are there in the Moon. Again, I will say that even Moon is chemistry. So chemist feels that chemistry is central science, so he became isolated. Physics has become isolation. Biology has isolated. Today I want the world to... Think science as one branch or one unit. It is not even bifurcated or trifurcated the way I have shown earth science or a biological science or a chemistry or a physics. But science is one and science is for not the well-being of humanity, but science is for well-being of the universe and the planet. Next slide, please. So if you look at physics and astrophysics or the older sciences, because for a physics scientist, you don't require any tools. What you need to do is in a dark night, you go out, look at the stars, some Milky Way will come, or you can get that which star is coming closer to Earth, and then you can do some science around it, and then publish a paper or write an article. So physics was one of the early sciences, astrophysics if you want to call. The first scientific observations were the sky, stars, planets, comets, and supernova. Copernicus, 1473, was the father of all the science. He described revolution of celestial bodies, establishing the revolution of the planets. Of course, then you look at Bruno. He described stars or the distant suns. 
there is no center to universe. And Tycho Brahe in 1546 called, he was called actually naked eye astronomer. He was able to see all these stars and all these planets with naked eye. That's why he was called a naked eye astronomer. He refuted belief of unchanged universe and precise measurements identified supernova 1572. Again, he was the one who coined the word Stellianovia in 1572 when science was not known. Next slide, please. Of course, these are the path breakers. I don't want to take you. The Kepler's law, we know. The Galileo's contributions and telescope and lenses were the biggest evolution to look at how astrophysics has evolved. And if you look at the gravitational physics, we wanted someone to look at apple falling down. Apple has been falling since the planet was made. But no one thought that there is some gravity for the earth that, that apple is falling down while it is not flying away. So, observing the environment around you is nothing but physics. Next slide, please. So, if you look at the life sciences, biological sciences, how it began. Again, while I said science was there since the Stone Age, but the proper documentation of science and the books or journals, all this has begun around 1700, 1600. And that's where we can say that the science, what we are talking of today, the benefits of science, the comfort of science creation has always been from here. Look at this great soul, Robert Hooke, born in 1635, not expected to survive because he had a genetic disorder. His diet was just milk and milk products because his digestive system had genetic problems and it didn't grow well. He had a weak constitution, developed a pronounced malformation of his body at 16 years, but developed expertise in making tools for life sciences. So that's how he studied the color patterns produced by the layers of materials. He wrote micrographia, then most famous discoveries, of course, cellular structure of slices, microorganism droplets, sperm cells, but he did not call them sperm cells, he called them animalcules, structure of feathers, nature of butterfly, and compound eye. All this was discovered by a great soul, even though he was not born like all of us, with genetic disorders, but great soul. Next slide, please. So, of course, human body, we all know how anatomy has come. We always talk of how our heritage science, sushrutas, surgical tools, so these all, all the revolutions which made the surgery, the medical sciences, physiology, the origin of blood, what is the role of blood, what are the nerve cells, neurons, I think all this has begun even when telescope, microscopes are not discovered, but scientific ingenuity and creativity was able to do all these discoveries much before even what we are talking of the modern science. Next slide, please. So chemistry, I claim, is the youngest subject. Those who practice chemistry or done a little bit of chemistry in your college at 12th standard or 11th standard, what you do is you will have Bunsen burner. You will have a round bottom flask or a beaker. You keep heating, taking two chemicals, put together, heat them, and something happens, and then you see what happens. That's how the whole chemical science has evolved. So chemical science is nothing but taking different elements, putting them together, heating or cooling, and then seeing what is happening. So, the proper scientific documentation required a thermometer because you want to know at what temperature you are heating your reaction. And you needed certain types of tools. So, that's how chemistry was the last science to be evolved after life sciences and physics. Next slide, please. So, this is the history of chemistry. As I told, I'm a chemist. I always feel proud that chemistry is the central science and without chemistry, Physics is not there, biology is not there, even planet is not there. So that's how chemists feel proud of what they do. But if you look at the origin of chemistry, imagine when Mendeleev made the periodic table. Imagine how he thought that more elements will be discovered and I have to leave some empty boxes that you need to fill them. So that's the creativity of Mendeleev. And now today we have 120 elements or 121 elements in the periodic table. But remember, like some of the animals or birds or insects, we talk of endangering and then we need to protect them. Some elements in periodic table, especially the lithium, is likely to be endangered because of all of us carrying more than one mobile phone which carries a lithium battery. So if lithium is not there, how are we going to carry a mobile phone in your pocket? So we need to now do science where lithium is not required but maybe magnesium battery or sodium battery which can do as effectively as lithium. But unfortunately it is not possible because of the electronic structure which lithium has, no other element has. 
So we need to now look at how I can make lithium in the lab. Can you make lithium in the lab? Other than taking from Chile or Australia somewhere, you take the ores. I think these are the questions we need to ponder around. Next slide, please. So modern chemistry, I'll not talk about X-ray and all that. Next, please. <clears throat> so as I told you, if you take as chemistry central science, food, battery paper, medicine, soap, petroleum, cement, plastic, clothes, all these are driven by the knowledge of chemistry. That's why interdisciplinarity of all sciences with chemistry make it a productive part. Next slide, please. So this we skip. Next slide, please. So as I told you, whether the science, what we are doing, is it boon or a bane? I think this is a question we need to ask. If industrial revolution is all because of science and technology, again, I'm cursing science because of that. Lithium became endangered. Global warming is happening. Pollution is increasing. Our life expectancy has gone up. But the lifestyle has become bad, all sorts of things. So boon is, of course, improved of quality life. Life expectancy has gone up. Energy has gone up. All this is there. But bane, environmental damages, depletion of natural resources, urbanization. Remember, this is one question I want to ask all of you. We don't give so much importance to agriculture and we give importance to urbanization. As we move villagers into cities and converting villages into towns and cities, the farming land is depleting. Only one good news to all of us is the global population will hit the stagnation number by 2030. I think we reach about 8.5 billion or 9 billion or some number and then it will stop there. But if the weight has grown in the last 30, 40 years, if it grows and reach 15 billion population and then the agricultural land has depleted, today already thanks to Swaminathan and Norman Burlog, whom we call fathers of green revolution, already per hectare you are getting the maximum crop. Instead of one crop, we went to two crops, we are getting three crops. Now do you want to get four crops? How do you get them? You want to do vertical farming, you do urban farming, rooftop farming, will it be sustainable? So we need to now ask a serious question, is urbanization right thing or in the right direction for this planet? As the question we need to ask and whether science can give a solution for this. Of course, if you can get me a seed variety per acre instead of getting four tons of material, can I get 40 tons of material? Will you make that seed? I need a genetic engineering scientist now. I need CRISPR technology. CRISPR is the one which is going to be a game changer. Hopefully, someone who's doing biotechnology will go and do CRISPR technology, a path-breaking technology for all the seed research. Next, please. <clears throat> so, when I say it's boon because of the glass, descript glass was discovered, okay? Pencilines were discovered, contraceptive pills. When I say population is under control because of the contraceptive pills. Then we developed the Haber process for ammonia. Can you believe we are not able to improve the Haber process which was made 80 years ago? Ammonia is made still by the Haber process. Then of course we discovered liquid crystals, that's where you have LEDs and all that. So science has made what is shown, x-ray, clothing, so surgeries, robotics, vaccinations. So this is what is the blessing of the science and we have to improve this slide more larger but not at the cost of environment. Next, please. So as I told while we want to live longer, we want to have quality life, but these diseases are going to kill us. If you are a rich man or a woman, because we eat pizzas and other stuff, you get obese. Cardiovascular diseases, maybe because they drink alcohol more. High blood pressure, because they are always stressed. CNS-related diseases. Cancer, type 2 diabetes, all this is for the affluent people. For disease of poverty, like African countries, because they don't have quality life, they have respiratory problems, HIV, AIDS was a killer, thanks to discoveries of HIV drugs, today we controlled it. Diarrhea, because the water quality is not good, tuberculosis, malaria, childhood diseases, neglected diseases, orphan diseases. So rich countries, poor countries. Now we claim we are a developing nation. So we are neither here nor here. So what disease will kill us? Average of both or a sum of both? God knows. Next slide, please. So we need role models. As I told, we don't need film role models, but scientists as role models. 
and if you look at amita bachan or nelson mandela nelson mandela died of tuberculosis those who follow his life so but they were courageous enough to go and tell i got tuberculosis but today if someone gets a disease of tuberculosis they are shy to tell rather they spread it more today when india is committed to tell that we want to make india a tb free nation by 2025 i think if someone is suffering from tb it's our job to identify cure it using whatever antibodies are available so that we make this country a tb free country and these are the people who advocated we pledge support for tb free india amitabh bachan or nelson mandela has become a poster boy of tuberculosis disease telling that i have tuberculosis but please protect yourself by living in proper ventilation and all sorts of things next slide please so this is a little contribution my group has done i don't want to bore you with that next slide please so this is one drug which is going to save us if multi drug resistance happens to tuberculosis bedaquilin is one drug which got approvals by the regulators and our group again has made some contributions in the sector next slide please this is something i want to share you a story look at this sirolimus increases the life span in mice okay you read the sentence in the fourth line that means if someone starts eating rapamycin instead of 120 that's the number which we know 140 you may live so as we start living longer of course we need more resources and if you look at the story of this molecule next slide please this was isolated by an indian scientist suren sehgal who actually was isolated in a company called ias laboratories in montreal dr suren sehgal did not destroy the sample going against the diktat of his company supervisors what happened was this company got bankrupt they getting close they said destroy all the chemicals dump in the garbage and go away from the company but the gentleman had a faith that this chemical is going to be a wonder chemical i want to carry he carried away against the then went to wyeth then went on to develop it became rapamycin today it worked as immunosuppressant we are, when i talk of organ transplant those who are study biology a little bit our body has a mechanism that our immune system rejects anything and everything which comes into our body so if for example my kidney is not working and my son wants to donate a kidney my body doesn't accept so i need to take immunosuppressant so suppress the immunity and then the transplant happens so this was the wonder drug which allowed transplantation of the organs giving life for our family members next slide please of course vaccine story all of us know how the evolution of vaccines happened again vaccine is a very serendipitous discovery at that time no one knew what is immunity what is an antibody or whether immune system working or not working or antigen nothing was known imagine smallpox vaccine by edward jenner in 1796 when these words were not discovered and a simple observation his observation was smallpox vaccine was developed by jenner after observation that people who had a cowpox did not catch smallpox so he believed that if someone has got a cowpox who is working with cows they get little exposure to cow infection so they developed the so called antibodies the word was not there he thought this is not coming so he started exposing people to cows which have cowpox so that they will not get chicken pox smallpox so that's how the entire vaccine research has begun and jenner himself isolated the smallpox then he realized why should i expose to cows uh, cowpox so he isolated the smallpox pus from people who got smallpox and he injected into a 8 year boy no clinical trials no regulators and was able to become the founding father of the entire vaccines and today we know that if vaccine was not there maybe one third of this room would have been not there during covid pandemic next slide please so i just want to be a very proud researcher as a scientist at iict when covaxin was getting launched by bharat biotech they required a chemical which is called an adjuvant and this adjuvant few milligrams was available in a us company but bharat biotech already grew the virus those who want to know how virus vaccines are made this is a old technology but the nobel prize was given to an mrna technology which is we'll not we'll talk at separate talk but here what you do like as i told you in the smallpox case he took the pus of a smallpox patient and make a powder either inject 
or put into the nostrils and your body will develop antibodies and then you get protection. So that's how the vaccine was there. So what Bharat Bhattak also realized, like we also take this virus from someone suffering from the COVID positive patients and grow in the laboratory. So you take some glass beads or some particles, you grow in a fermentation lab, you grow them and kill them. Still some life is there, the DNA is protected. You give an injection and your body will react. So you are getting a mild infection and that will produce antibodies. That's the philosophy of the Bharat Biotech vaccine. But it required an adjuvant to enhance the activity at least by 40%. Unless you add an adjuvant, it will not give you the response the way it has given. So ISCT during lockdown has worked on making the adjuvant and we have made about 20 kilos of adjuvant. And this adjuvant was wired. So if you have taken a Covaxin injection, it will have 15 micrograms of the adjuvant and that was made in the laboratory which I was heading before I became Secretary of Government of India. So, of course, that has been, we are proud that we got recognition from the government, we got medals and rewards and all that. As I told, we did not work for that, but fortunately, it has been rewarded. So, this tells you a story that a serendipitous observation that someone working in the cow field is not getting smallpox observation has given entire journey of vaccines today, polio vaccine. If polio vaccine was not there, I can assure you one third of us would have been polio victims. So, so this is how science evolved over a period of centuries. Next slide, please. This is another contribution. Those who were again during COVID time, remdesivir injection was on big demand. And again, we made a technology against the wishes of the multinationals. We made the processes given to companies. But luckily, by the time government of India negotiated with the U.S. innovator, and then we got licenses done, and then Remdesivir has saved some lives. Next, please. So if you look at health part, as I told, we have done some contributions, but health, of course, is very critical. Next, please. If you look at the evolution of agriculture, I'll take another 10 minutes, maybe. Agriculture, as I told, when Homo sapiens, Homo erectus evolving to Homo sapiens, we were hunters and gatherers. If you go back and look at Wikipedia, so there was nothing like farming. So whatever animal come close to you, you kill and eat the meat. And the lazy people became vegetarians like me. Those who had no energy to go and hunt animals. They became vegetarians. Oh, sorry, that's not the story. So when these gatherers and hunters were moving across the Nile River, and if you look at the origin of all of us, our ancestors began their journey from Africa. And if you look at the publication by CCMB from Hyderabad, how the human race has moved from Africa, the first origin of the Homo sapiens, and how they traveled either through Europe or through Sri Lanka, and then they came into India, or how the humanity has, human beings, not humanity, has spread across this globe, is a genetic study to really enjoy. So this hunters and gatherers, they evolved and then they realized that there is not enough food. And then they looked accidentally that if a flower had fell at some place and a seed has fallen, it grew again. Oh, it's something I can grow on my own. So that, that human being picked up that seed. And slowly, these hunters and gatherers started colonizing themselves, make a small group of 40, 50 lazy people, do some agriculture, instead of traveling across the Nile River and eating what available, stay at one place and grow something. I think that's how the entire agriculture has begun. And if you look at the way agriculture evolved in this almost to an age, till today we are looking at, next slide please. We are talking of now drones, adding urea to the soil to increase the nitrogen and then make more, as I told, three crops per, per cycle. You don't get, unless you add a lot of urea, unless you supply nitrogen, your crop will not grow. But unfortunately, if you look at urea, while farmer needs urea, I want to tell you a story of the government of India. Urea currently is production, manufacturing, selling cost about 3,500 rupees per 25 kilo bag a farmer gets. If he has to pay 3,500 per 25 kilo bag and want to make a product, the product cost will be at least three times or four times of what we are getting today. Sometimes we complain that 
farmer is getting a subsidy and uh, I am I am a taxpayer. I think we all who pay tax have to get out of that mind, telling that the tax what we are paying is given as a subsidy to the farmer. Farmer gets urea at 350 rupees per bag. That is why he is selling you rice or wheat at 30 rupees or 40 rupees and you are able to buy it. If he gets 3500 rupees, he will increase the price of paddy and wheat and sugar to five times the price and you can't afford. And we don't do any taxation to water to the farmer. If you, even farmer has to buy water, imagine the cost of water adding to the crop. So we should be little generous in paying our income tax off. Now coming back to this urea subsidy, while this is all well taken, but if you look at our environmental problem now, we all use mostly diesel vehicles, because diesel was cheaper, it goes mileage jada hota hai thoda, it has better engine, whatever. But now because we are signatory to Euro 6 version, AdBlue, which is 99.999% ultra pure urea solution, is added to your diesel engine and that is a cost. So we are taking farmer's urea and adding into our diesel vehicle. So can we make signs that my diesel engine does not produce nitric oxide? By the way, all this is to trap nitric oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So nitric oxide reacts with urea and it becomes nitrous, some chemical, and then it is not harmful to the environment. So can I develop chemistry which will not take away farmer's urea, but some other chemical. This is a problem for all of us. Next slide, please. So, of course, we talked of Norman Borlaug and Green Revolution. Next, please. So, the evolution happened and the way the revolution happened, 1,000 metric tons growth, wheat and rice, India became world leader in both wheat, rice, and today we are also largest producer of sugar. Next slide, please. So, we evolved new trends in agriculture. I want that our computer scientists, electronic scientists, AI, machine learning scientists, how we all integrate our knowledge that farming becomes integrated, farmer becomes rich. We talk of doubling the farmer's income, but how can we incorporate technologies to farm? I think that should be the focus of our engineering friends. Next slide, please. Skip it, yeah. Skip it, please. So this is to tell you that those who are vegetarians and still want to eat or get the feel of eating a meat, you can buy plant-based meat, fermentation-based meat, cultivated meat, without killing the animal, you get the meat. So, there is a study that if you want to grow one kilo of meat, when I say grow, that means you have to have a sheep or a chicken. The kind of water resources we consume, or the grass the sheep eats, the cost of that meat versus one kilo potato, if you compare the environmental damage one kilo meat does is 20 times larger than producing one kilo of potato. So can we now grow lab-grown meat so that you don't require to grow animals, cows or whatever, buffaloes or whatever meat people eat? So this shows you that science has progressed in such a way that you can grow even meat in the lab using fermentation processes. Next slide, please. Next, please. So of course, the last part is energy. As I told, this is the driving force for all of us. We took the first, next slide. So if you look at the first energy we got is from sun. If you look at fire is a discovery rather than invention, that's a statement. Fire was most likely given to the man, please understand, human, as a gift from the heavens when a bolt of lightning struck a tree or a bush, suddenly starting a fire. And around 400,000 BC, fire was kindled in the caves of Peking man. So fire came once. And he was protecting it in a, uh, in a cave because he, he knows it will not come back again. So whenever you want a fire, you go to the cave and borrow the fire, basically. So prehistoric man used primitive lamps to illuminate his cave. And that's how the bulb, candle, wax, all that science over two million years has evolved. Next, please. Then we consumed all our, as I told, fossil fuels. That slide I'm not talking today. Now, we, next, go back, go back, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So we want to now get wind energy, biomass, which our chancellor was talking today, hydro, solar, geothermal, tidal. So when the ocean tides are there, can I get 
tap that energy and convert electricity. It's a big science to happen around. Of course, solar is a big thing in our country. But hydro, I think, is going to be the next generation. You buy, instead of petrol or diesel, you buy one liter of bislery bottle or aquafina water bottle, put into your tank. There's a catalyst, splits, hydrogen will go to engine to run, oxygen will come through air conditioner to your car, and you get the best oxygen. Will it happen in 2050? Otherwise, you're on the bullock card, my friends, okay? Next slide, please. Next, please, yeah. So these are all, during G20, we're talking on COP27 observations, who is contributing more to the planet, spoiling carbon dioxide. I think there's no reason to blame each other. Now someone has spoiled it, either the industrial revolution of Europe or America. We can't say that now, then you spoiled, now I will spoil. I consume only 4%. I mean, if you look at India's contribution, it's very low. Whoever contributes, it's going to be in this universe. It's not going away from here. And global warming will happen, and we all will suffer. That's why the G20 nations come to consensus, telling that, okay, we're all signatories. None of us will spoil the planet. I think that's the message this G20 has given to all of us. Next, please. Skip it here, please. So as I told, minimal carbon footprint. If you look at Bhutan, becomes the world's first carbon negative country. Small, tiny country somewhere here in Himalayan belt. It became carbon negative country. But India is a too large a country. Our aspirations are very high. We wanted more materials. We wanted better lifestyle. So, but then how can India become carbon neutral? E is going to be, forget carbon negative, at least carbon neutral. So, if I take one kilo of carbon from the planet, I have to give back one kilo of carbon back to the planet. I think that cycle has to be built. That's the net zero principles, hopefully. And we'll make sure that carbon dioxide concentrations don't increase beyond 450 ppm, which will make globe warm by 2 degrees. And that's the end of all of us. Next slide, please. Sustain, as I told you, these slides we have to show in a public lecture to understand all of us, to educate all of us, that sustainability is the mantra for all of us. And the ability to be maintained at a certain level or rate, avoidance of depletion, meeting our needs without compromising the ability of future generations. Three pillars of sustainability, as I told you, it has to be social, economic, and environmental. Next, please. Future. Last slide, by the way. Basic human needs provided to everyone, free of charge, as I told, will be taken for granted. And we abuse it. Today, if someone does not put electricity bill, I will not switch off my air conditioning in my room before coming here to lecture. But if someone says that I have to pay my electricity bill, I will switch off and come. And I have some lazy souls in my friends in Mumbai, not knowing that they are stuck in traffic. They have some app, I think smart app, some computer fellow developed in this college. So you can turn on your air conditioner before you reach the home. Why do you need that comfort? If it's still warm, then turn on the AC. And some of my friends in the US, while the meeting is going on, they take their Apple phone and turn on the AC of the car. Because by the time you go to the car, your car has to be cool. Do you really need that comfort? I think that's the question we need to ask. So computer scientists are also damaging our planet. Huh? I thought they only work at the computer and do one computer and one keyboard, they're happy souls. No. So focus will be on the non-basic luxuries, fancy self-driving cars. We are seeing Tesla cars. I mean, is it towards good of the planet or not so good of the planet? I think these questions we have to ask before you invent something or you discover something. But unfortunately, the gap between rich and poor is increasing. We need to reduce it. Otherwise, we'll have more challenges and we need more police people. Machines will be designed to suit the temperament of the customer. I mean, this is a statement in that book, which really I liked. It says, if my car is smart, and it is AI ML driven, I don't know what is AI ML, big word, okay? Now, I'm sitting in a car, it's a Tesla car or some company, auto car. Now, suddenly, it, some Hyderabad auto driver is coming in the opposite direction with school children. That fellow will drive his own way, auto driver, in Hyderabad. Now my Tesla car will think, if I apply sudden brake, my owner will be disturbed, poor fellow, he's sleeping already. If I go and hit that auto, my car is well protected with all airbags and all that, 
let the kids in the ought to die. That's how the AML thinking. Then that car is very very cheap. Okay, it's a very selfish car or egoistic car. Or there's an altruistic car which thinks, okay, let me apply a brake or even if required, I'll go and hit a neighboring tree, take a cut so that my owner gets small injuries but auto is protected. How that AML will think now? Will it think in the welfare of the owner of the car or welfare of the oncoming auto? So one would be an altruistic vehicle, one would be an egoistic car. Which will be cheaper, which will be costlier? Which one you will buy? Okay? So, maybe I'll buy, I'm a good guy, I'll buy an altruistic car, okay? Does everything in its power to save its owner even if it means killing others? That would be the egoistic car. So, science is taking us in a direction where computers think on our behalf, which is good, maybe better, but how we are going to use this knowledge for welfare of this planet in the evolutionary process of science which began at the Stone Age till today to Zen Alpha beyond, I think is the question we need to ask and see that this planet goes on forever and never stops and we never go back to either a horse or a bullock cart, but we may go to hydrogen and protect the environment. Next please. Yeah, so of course as a good citizen, disclaimer is the data from here is acknowledged as I told mostly from the book and something from Wikipedia and Google search and some opinions I made, some loose talk, which is all my personal and nothing to do with my institute or my organization. Next, please. And of course, as I said, I'm a wildlife guy who keep traveling in Central India. History of science, which I studied for Stone Age or Future of Science, is essential to understand the process, trends, and future of science, not just for human well-being, for the planet's well-being. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for an insightful lecture. I'd like to open up the floor to the audience now to ask any questions they may have or if they wish to engage. Please raise your hands and we shall pass over the mic to you. Can you please hand over the mic over there? Hello. Hello, sir. I'm Pranit Nuti. So uh, you spoke about stem cell theory and uh, the uh, how it would increase the lifespan of humans. Uh, but there are also uh, deadly virus viruses like Corona, uh, which are killing uh, maybe thousands of people across the uh, across the globe. So uh, how do we tackle this extremely positive and negative events? that happen uh, maybe uh, in 10 years to come? And uh, how are scientists dealing with this dilemma? Currently, when you look at COVID pandemic, whatever we have seen, was a human-animal conflict. We all know that it came from bats. Uh, all these coronaviruses have base in bats. And because of the proximity of human beings and bats in China, it has come up. So currently, again, the global research organizations are trying to make one health philosophy. That means you don't worry about your own health, as I told you. We don't be selfish to be homo sapien to be the best in the world. But can I protect my cat? Can I protect my dog? Can I protect my cow or a buffalo? Or even all the animal kingdoms? So the zoonotic relation, what we have, I think is addressed. And that is where research is going to see that we don't cross over the diseases from human to animal or animal to human. If you look at diseases we have seen, whenever uh, there's a chicken outburst, we go and kill all the chicks in the farms. Or if it's coming from pigs, we go and kill all the pigs. I think this conflict of human-animal has to be minimized. And that's where the whole world is working currently, one. And number two, if you 
start working on immunity of all of us. I personally believe we are vulnerable because, of course, one, we are going away from natural way of living to artificial living. So if we can start increasing our immunity, by whatever means, I'm not propagating churn prash, but whatever you want to eat to increase your churn, I mean, by immunity or by vitamin C or, or food habits or yoga or best oxygen or everyday doing exercise, then if your immunity is better, we can reduce the burden on the health system, reduce the intake of medicines, and that's how I think we need to progress. I'm healthy. Would it be possible, for example, the existing science and technology management and education management to contain those changes in the years to come? So actually, it's a very, very important question to debate today. Most of our research is driven by keywords, if I want to use the word. Suddenly, I mean, so you are an organic chemist. So if someone says organic catalysis is... Nobel Prize has been given, so all of us will jump in to do some research there, here and there, and then get some publications and get a reward or an award or whatever. We are not driven by passion, but we are driven by the external factors. One, as I told you, science, when we want to educate in the classroom, has to be passion-driven. Today, if I look at my armed forces, it is their passion to serve the nation at the cost of their life. Scientists cannot work whether I'm getting old pension scheme or new pension scheme. I am driven by my passion like my army jawan is willing to give his life for the country. Can as a scientist do something 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day, but I want my science to be sustainable, my science to be useful and affordable. So we need to bring in this kind of things in the education system that the scientist who comes out in 2040 or 2050 will think as a holistic problem for the planet rather than a lab-centric problem. So this holistic approach is required for all of us. That's why the science cannot be fragmented. It's to be one science, like when we talk of one planet, one Earth, whatever we had for our G20. I think one science. I think that we need to educate and people are excited, again, with all due regards to our Chandrayaan or space research. I think the excitement what you get looking at a rocket going into the moon, you did not get that excitement when vaccine was discovered. Honestly. There, was there a live telecast of uh, either mRNA vaccine or AstraZeneca's uh, Covishield or Covaxin? I think we have to celebrate science. I think that has to be taught to all of us. Excitement is not that I discovered something robotic thing which will come and serve me tea uh, in this audience by a robo, by my engineering friend. I mean, I'm sure in engineering college I go, first thing they show is a robo doing some activities. Fine, I mean, it's, it's towards future. But I think we need to celebrate science which is going to be providing well-being, holistic well-being of this planet. And I think that's the kind of curriculum we need to build. Again, I'm philosophical, but uh, sorry. So that's what I think we need to really take forward. Yeah. Please, sir. Wonderful science and engineering. Yeah, of course. But uh, we are having very less growth enrollment ratio of uh, students uh, at FYBSC, particularly this year. Almost uh, admission reduced to 50%. So, uh, how to increase interest of students towards basic sciences? That is my first Just question. Just to tell you, you know, some university asked me, can you join us and increase the enrollment? I said, I'll not join you. <laughs> I tell you again that we are driven by, with all due respects to my backbenchers, we are all driven by, not by passion of life, we are driven by the campus placement and package. Yeah. I think we need to accept this fact. We have become a materialistic, that's what I said, we are the most, homo sapiens is the most selfish 
human I mean, life anyway. So we are driven by those parameters, not by ex excitement of life. I mean, I used to make some loose comments against uh, uh, the IT professionals who work odd hours, including my nephews and niece. They say, uh, they call me mama. I mean, mama, I have to log in at 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. and I have to be there once in a while, touch the mouse, uh, so that they know I am logged in. Am I correct? I mean, you're not doing the jobs yet, but those who are doing jobs already. So is it giving you excitement? Just once in a while, touch the mouse pad, to see that you are logged in. Or, or you, I mean, even there you can contribute as a researcher or as a technocrat. So we are driven by this kind of mindset. So that's what I think I said we need to relook at. As I told, I only tell you th threats actually. Okay? The threats are because of the revolutions, industrial revolutions. We have consumed more than what our 5,000 years of consumption, okay, the civilization, if you call of Indus civilization, whatever you talk of time frame, the damage we have done in these 140, 180 years is 100 times more than what those 5,000 years of humanity has done to the planet, in whatever form it is. So, it is we all like our armed forces. Now, I am a patriotic. Patriotism is not to the country, yeah? patriotism to the planet. Patriotism is not to Telangana or Hyderabad or India. Patriotism to the planet. I think that culture, if you bring in, again, as I told, front benchers will disappear in 20 years before stem cells come, or 30 years, I don't know. I mean, if someone is 70, maybe 30 years. I'm giving you 100 years only, not 120. Uh, Pillai sahab also, me also, all of us, okay? Let us be, 100 is already too long. I'm getting bored already. Okay. So, but, Please understand, you're all 20s and 80 years of life. As I told you, that graph is going up. The average expectancy will go to 95, 100, 110, I don't know where we end up. But whether the quality of life what I have today will have that day. For that, as I told, hydrogen is a game changer, for example. Or de-urbanization, I mean, it's a bad word, but I don't know what the right word to use. English, I don't, I'm not an expert. How I minimize the urbanization? But provide all the... Com Why I come to Hyderabad is because there's no power cut, there's no there's a proper road, and there's a multiplex theater. I mean, these are driving factors for me to live in Hyderabad. And an airport close by to come and give some useless talk here. But if we can provide all these materials in some way, even tier 2, tier 3, that urbanization will come down drastically. And we need to distribute the planet. China and India is, at least there's one nice slide the other day, I saw it on my mobile actually. Like if 50% of the population live in South Asia, and 80% of the universe is only 20%, exactly same formula, 80-20, all the management MBA students are here, maybe if they are 80-20, 80% people fill, 20% people perform. So how do you reverse it now? I think these are the questions we need to keep asking and hopefully, I think we are in the right direction. I can assure you the way the world is reacting to the global warming, the challenges, the sharing of knowledge, I think we are in the right path and backbenchers need not worry. You will live 130 years. <coughs> Please. Professor, you spoke about uh, you know, yeah. you well because that's where it's, it's going to be a future. So what is your take on to, you know, when you, we speak about uh, renewables and renewables, so there is a, always a debate between food and fuel, because then I need to shift my, some of the things from food to fuel. So what is, because uh, if I want ethanol, I need something sucrose, driven crops, so maize crop, I'll shift on the other side. Even in a hydrogen, we have been talking hydrogen right from around 2000, we were, you know, and then there are still so many issues persistent. So what is your take on to this particular, because uh, that's where, you know, now agriculture is shifting from uh, one way to other. So people wants to grow more on a cash kind of a crop wherein they can get more uh, revenue, you know, the doubling the farmer's uh, income, which, which is in a far-fetched dream, but that's okay. What is your take? 
know, I'm not, uh, I mean, to debate on uh, food versus fuel, okay. Now, how are you going to take material which is absolutely not worthy as a food to anything? So, after taking all cycles of food part, you need to go and make a fuel. I mean, which of course, as I said, life is more important than fuel. I mean, we have to accept whether it's animal life. If you don't have a buffalo or a cow without grass, I mean, you would take whole grass and make ethanol and start driving a car. I mean, your kid will not get, your grandkid will not get milk, for example. So, we need to look at alternate sources of energy, as I told you, solar, wind and hydrogen. While hydrogen, I keep talking, there are also critics of hydrogen telling that this planet has only a certain amount of water. So, if I split, keep on splitting water from the ocean, if not today, maybe after 10,000 years, if all water is split into hydrogen and oxygen, and if my byproducts of water is not farming, because whatever you get rain is only from the sea. So, 70% water, 30% land. So, if all that 70% water is over after 1,000 years, 10,000, I don't know, whatever time. So, how are you going to handle it? So, your byproduct of all your processes has to be water. Anything I do an experiment, if my water is byproduct, then I think I recycle the water. That's what I said. Sustainability is what I take from nature has to be given back. Our whole science has to be so circular. And certainly, if you ask me food versus fuel, food gets priority and we, we have no right to take away food of animals just because you are homo sapien. <clears throat> And I just before while, actually the book which I currently am making, reading to make slides, is a book of uh, Tony Robbins, T-O-N-Y, Tony Robbins. The book name is Life Force. Okay. Someone has energy to read, it's a 750 page book. Okay. But only 500 rupees actually. So, one rupee, two pages. Very affordable. Outstanding future of life. As I told you, when you can go to an ATM machine, put your debit card or credit card and get your stem cells, go to somewhere, grow them, I think it's going to happen. Yeah. Thank you. So it's been a privilege to have you with us imparting invaluable insights that truly convey evolution in the field of science. Before we conclude, I now invite our principal, Dr. Shubha Pandit Ma'am, to deliver the vote of thanks and express our heartfelt appreciation. A very good afternoon to everyone. I'm here to propose the vote of thanks to all of you. We've had the privilege of listening to an insightful and enlightening lecture by Dr. S. Chandrasekhar. So I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks, sir, for such a wonderful insights on topics which are relevant everyone. You've brought some of the relevant questions which each of us should try to address because it's for the earth, Mother Earth that you are talking about. And I think as humans who should be worrying, I think your topic was too good. I would like to express my gratitude to our Chancellor, Sri Samir Somaya, for his constant motivation and encouragement for organizing such events. I would also like to thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Raj Sekharan Pillai, for initiating Somaya Public Lecture and getting experts in various domains. This has enabled all of us at Somaya as well as the general public, to the expertise of eminent professionals. I would also like to express my thanks, special thanks, to Lieutenant General Jagbir Singh, sir, for gracing the occasion. 
I would like to extend thanks to the guests, invitees, and other dignitaries of Somaya University and SVV institutions who made it to attend this lecture and grace the occasion. I would also like to thank the Student Council for organizing this event on such a large scale. Their enthusiasm is truly to be admi admired while they work tirelessly behind the scenes. The dedication and hard work have made today's event a resounding success. The Associate Dean Student Affairs, Dr. Sudha Gupta and Dr. Vandana Satam, her associate, the Vice Principal, heads of the departments, as well as other faculty members of the college and staff of the college have always been very supportive in each and every activity of the college. In fact, they form the backbone of the college. Their contributions have enabled the college administration to reach major milestones in academics. Their dedication and hard work have made today's lecture a great success. Lord, last but not the least, I want to express my gratitude to the students attending this lecture. Their active participation and engagement have made this a vibrant and enriching experience for all. I'm also grateful to all from the sound, lighting, as well as the SVV PR and IT team who have contributed immensely for the smooth functioning of this event. Additionally, I might have inadvertently not mentioned someone who has helped us in this activity. Please accept my gratitude towards your help. In conclusion, I would like to say that today's lecture had been a remarkable journey of knowledge and inspiration, and it would have not been possible without the collective effort of everyone involved. Thank you again, all of you. Thanks a lot. Now, since the this is this lecture was a part of Abhiyantriki, and Abhiyantriki is going to continue for the next two days. Uh, I would like to request all to proceed for lunch, and we will not have national anthem, which is normally the tradition, because this is going to be a continuing activity. Thank you, everyone, and uh, please proceed for lunch. The dignitaries, please proceed to the boardroom of our college for the lunch. Thank you very much.